Hello. Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being here. Um, I have not given this talk since 2011, so it's been a while. Um, I gave this talk at GDC in San Francisco uh, with Tom Hall, and this is what we called the Doom Postmortem. So this was, it was the first time that we talked about the creation of our game Doom. So as you can see, Doom came out in 1993. Um, I'm just, just a second here. Let me, all right. So uh, the story of Doom has roots in August of 1991. Uh, let's see, make sure. Is, is there audio on this? There's a lot of audio in this uh, presentation. I'm not sure if it's hooked up. Uh, we wanted to move id Software basically from Freeport, Louisiana to somewhere else, like anywhere else. <laughs> it was really hot. Uh, anywhere that was you know, not 40 degrees Celsius. So Tom Hall went to college in Madison, Wisconsin, and he offered the city as a suggestion for us to move to. So, I flew out to Madison with Tom. Uh, we checked out the city. It's pretty cool. Uh, really cool place. And we just decided that we we're going to move the company. Uh, there were only four of us, so not a big problem. Uh, but you know, by December 1991, we were found dead in the snow, victims of Wisconsin's insane winters. We made a huge mistake. Uh, good thing that we were working 16-hour days and we stayed inside. So during this December, John Carmack discovered the next computer by Steve Jobs, uh, his post-Apple company, and uh, we, he wanted one. So he saved up the money that he had been making it in software up until that time, and as it was Christmas time then, uh, the other three of us decided, you know, we're going to go somewhere else that's warm for two weeks of vacation uh, during Christmas, you know, and John just stayed behind. He didn't want to go anywhere. So he ordered the computer, uh, cash on delivery. So John, who had no car, he had to walk through the snow to the bank uh, to get a cashier's check for $11,000 so he could buy the computer. OK, so the computer arrived, and it was pretty awesome. John learned how to program the computer over the holiday break. Objective-C and Next Step were like a total dream compared to DOS. We all got, when we all got back from our uh, vacation, we decided that we were going to make another trilogy of Commander King games. We'd already made two, two trilogies at that point of Commander King games, and Tom had this, uh, Tom, you know, was this uh, George Lucas vision of three trilogies. <laughs> so uh, you know, we had to work on the third one. So we had just shipped King 6. And uh, we were starting on Keen 7, 8, and 9. Uh, this is a screen from uh, the, like a prototype of, of Keen 7. And the trilogy was called The Universe's Toast. So it should have been called uh, The Commander Keen Universe's Toast because we decided that we'd had enough of Commander Keen and we wanted to explore 3D games uh, some more. We just delivered Catacomb 3D in November of 1991 and it used texture mapping which was a hot new technology. This was six months before Ultima Underworld was released. We decided that we would make an updated 3D version of the 1981 classic Apple II game, Castle Wolfenstein. We called our game Wolfenstein 3D, and it took us four months to ship the Sharer episode and two months to add five more episodes and a hint book. And we created the hint book on the next computer. So a month after releasing Wolfenstein, we were contacted by a Japanese Nintendo game publisher called Imagineer. They wanted Wolfenstein on the Super Nintendo. Since we're about to start developing a prequel to Wolfenstein called Spear of Destiny, we hired a contractor to start working on that Super Nintendo version. So then it's November 1992. We ship Spear of Destiny. And then we decide that we're going to make another first-person shooter. We thought that Wolfenstein turned out pretty well. We could actually, we could tell that. <laughs> uh, although at this early date, the term FPS didn't even exist. We don't know what to call our games other than 3D at that point. 
So we decided to call the new game Doom. At this point, it's just a word. Uh, no logo exists or even an idea of what that logo would look like. Doom would be our fifth FPS. The term FPS didn't exist. You know, uh, the first FPS that we made, Hover Tank 1, was a solid-filled polygon maze. Uh, Catacomb 3D was our first texture-mapped 3D game. And Wolfenstein 3D would be our first VGA 256 color FPS. And uh, Doom would be a pretty huge jump in technology beyond that. So we moved the company from a uh, one-bedroom loft apartment that was in uh, Mesquite, Texas, to this black cube that was just down the street. Uh, we, we were located on the sixth floor of this building. Eventually, it was uh, Suite 666. <laughs> so we continued to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons, as we had for years. Uh, while writing the Doom Bible, we needed a new file name suffix. So up until that point, every game that we had made in DOS uh, had a shortened version of the game's name as the suffix. So Wolfenstein 3D was W3D, so it was like, you know, Wolf dot, you know, Wolf dot exe, but uh, graphics dot W3D. Spear of Destiny was SOD. Uh, but for Doom, Tom decided on WAD, which was short for Where's All the Data? <laughs> <laughs> it's all in one giant file, that's where it's at. Um, so Tom was working away on the Doom Bible, which even back then we didn't call them design documents, we just had to come up with a name, so we called it, he called it the Doom Bible. Uh, the early uh, design doc for Doom uh, was basically completed on November 28th of 1992. So he came up with several characters, their names, their backgrounds, lots of other stuff. It's a really, it's actually a pretty big book. Uh, this is one of the pages from the Doom Bible. It describes a preview of what the game will have in it. So some of these features were not in the game, like cinematics. <laughs> um, up until this point, our game has progressed by going from one level to the next. You know, always reaching the end of a level where the game would then load the next level. John Carmack had a more advanced vision of progression, one where players could smoothly progress within one huge streaming map, not unlike World of Warcraft. So in practice, as he was writing this Doom engine, it proved to be very impractical for several reasons. So John's new world of vision of level progression became more traditional. So we were back to level by level progression. There was just too much other tech in the, in the engine. So Tom worked for a month on a really big seamless world. <laughs> and he had to toss it away and get to work on creating new discrete level locations. So now, it's November 1992. We started getting the engine tech working and the level editor, Doom Ed, up on the screen. Tom Hall, pictured here, was playing with it. He was offering suggestions. He was in the big open room that we had and not actually in an office like the rest of us, so he just drew lines on the floor with masking tape. On Tom's monitor at the top is the word quality, in case you were wondering what that was. Uh, at this point, Tom was kind of a little unhappy after having to redesign the game to play level by level. And uh, this is after, you know, earlier in the same year, 1992, having to, you know, fight for push walls in Wolfenstein 3D. So creatively, it was kind of a struggle. So unbelievably, uh, we issued a press release just as we started working on the game. <laughs> Not before we release it, just as we're starting to work on it. We basically said that Doom was going to be, have the greatest technology ever in a computer game at the time. <laughs> That's what you do when you're 25. <laughs> so this is a list of the features that the game would have. The most important being the last line, an open game. So the month, this month in January, we wrote a tool called the Fuzzy Pumper Palette Shop, which took video captured images and palletized them to our custom VGA palette that we had hand-created for, for Doom. So I, create, I continued working on Doom Ed, 
and things were you know, starting to really begin on the game after the holidays. Like This was the month that we started for real. So February. Uh, this is Adrian Carmack. He's modeling the Baron of Hell based on his sketch that's right in front of him. Um, Kevin, which was the other artist on the game, there were only two. Kevin created the imp in Deluxe Paint 2 on the PC. And when clay ended up being a bad idea for animation, uh, we turned to a Hollywood monster creator, and he made a few models for us. So the first one that we needed was the Spider Mastermind. It was made with latex and metal, and we needed him for the end boss of episode three. And you could tell that everything moved on him, so animation was actually possible. We decided that since we we're scanning most of our models, uh, why wouldn't we scan weapons as well? So even though it was Texas, we decided to get toy guns from the store. <laughs> uh, as the, <laughs> it was safer that way. As the, I mean, we're game developers. We're going to shoot somebody accidentally. As the design of the game was influenced by the movie Evil Dead, we decided that you know, we wanted a chainsaw and a shotgun in this game. So this is the actual chainsaw that Tom Hall brought in. His girlfriend had one, so he just borrowed it. It was called the Eager Beaver, and uh, we kept it in a bowl because it leaked oil. <laughs> Tom actually still has this chainsaw. So the shotgun was actually a, what's called a Tootsie Toy Dakota cap gun. <laughs> we got it at Toys R Us, which was like around the corner. So at the same time that we're trying to figure out what levels would look like, yeah, you know, as we're building the game, we're trying to figure out like what are the levels going to look like. This technology can do a lot of stuff. So for our entire lives, until that point, the only kinds of game levels that we'd really seen were 90 degree block walls like Wolfenstein 3D. So Might and Magic, Ultima, Wizardry, Midi Maze, Labyrinth, Way Out, you name a maze game, it had 90 degree walls in it. There really weren't any examples of anything else. So, um, so it was a struggle trying to come, kind of break out of that mindset. So John Carmack told Tom, hey, get, get some books about military building construction. Maybe that'll help. Uh, Tom did that, and he got really bored with it, as, you know, they're not very inspiring places to play in. <laughs> so it was kind of burning Tom out, this, uh, this wall that he hit. So the first level in Doom was called The Hangar, and originally it started like this. Um, actually, it started with this other thing. There's four, four uh, Marines were playing cards on a, on a crate. You'll see it in a second here. This is, um, this is like the original UI that we had in the game, because we thought we were going to have an auto map in the corner, uh, and everything, you know, all kinds of stuff like you have this cool helmet on. And there's the, uh, there's the crate that you would start at. But we, we eventually removed all that UI because we want to see more of the game world. And we could actually do it at, at a good speed. So here is what Doom looked like on February 4th after one month of work. It didn't have any sound. <laughs> there was no sound in it at that point. So it was, Evil Unleashed was like a subtitle for the game. So you can kind of see, uh, just barely moving around. I don't know if you can even hear that off of my headphone. <laughs> yeah? Oh, I see. I'll turn it down so it's not so loud. All right, we will have sound in a second. Okay, got it. Okay. Now you can hear the music that was created in the future beyond this prototype. <laughs> Baron of Hell, um, you can see that we had the UI up on top of everything. Um, the engine still wasn't as fast as it was going to be, but it was it was actually rendering 
You can see the mouth even has an orange color instead of a red color. Lots of little details that, that changed over time. So it's now March, which is our third month of uh, actual game development. Something kind of random happened one day. No, we're not going to watch a movie. Um, 20th Century Fox offered us the use of the Aliens license. So we seriously thought about theming the game around Aliens, um, around the game Alien, or the movie Alien. Uh, it totally matched a lot of the ideas that we had uh, wanted to put in the game and what we wanted the game to be. But then, you know, there weren't any demons in Aliens. Uh, <laughs> Just alien monsters, and that wouldn't really be a new idea. So we just scrapped the concept of using the license after talking it over for about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the biggest problems, obviously, was trying to come up with a new way of creating levels you know, that did not look like Wolfenstein. In fact, that became one of the, uh, one of the, the defining concepts around level design, was if it looked like Wolfenstein, any room looked like Wolfenstein, you have failed. Um, so the military bunker style just wasn't cutting it. Something needed to be done. So one day I decided to solve the problem, and I created this abstract uh, 3D level design style. I used e E1M2 as my experimentation location. So you can see we still had that HUD up there, but now I'm putting we're putting shadows in. Uh, that's a wall you don't really ever see in the game because it doesn't look that good. Um, but this was the room, uh, this was the entry room, but this room right here is the room where I actually created uh, the height of the game where it kind of felt like, like it was kind of cool. Um, back then it was really, really cool. Right now it doesn't look so cool. But it was awesome back then. So that was, you know, I even brought everybody in the, in the room to see this, uh, this, this piece of the level that I had made and everybody agreed, holy crap, this is it. So this was the beginning of the abstract level design style. So um, then out of nowhere, uh, disaster struck. All work on Doom stopped. If you remember, uh, there was a Super Nintendo version that was supposed to be worked on. <laughs> and we hired somebody. But it wasn't done yet. We weren't even paying attention to the person who was supposed to be working on it. Um, and the publisher was not pleased that the game was not done. I mean, this was like nine months <laughs> after. So uh, we had to do the port to the Super Nintendo internally ourselves. So we had to stop working on, stop working on Doom and just start working on the Super Nintendo version. So we had, to, we had to actually learn the hardware. I mean, it's, it's a Super Nintendo, it's not a PC. So we had to go back to 65816 assembly language. Um, had to le learn the hardware, and then we had to actually code the game, do all the graphics for the Super Nintendo and all that stuff, and it took us three weeks to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not too bad. I mean, we used to make games in two months, so three weeks was turbo mode. So then work on Doom resumed, so we are all very, you know, back in the happy space. Okay, so um, we're now in April. If you can't tell, this is month by month recreation. Um, so while creating E1M2, the, the fun experimentation lab, I actually created a problem for John Carmack's renderer. The stairs that I show you there, uh, they slowed the code way down because of the way that he was ordering the sectors. So John had to find a solution. It was basically recursing through a sector list, which kills things. Um, so he found a white paper from uh, a person named Bruce Naylor about this data structure called a binary space partition. So it was originally designed for backface culling of 3D models, but John adapted it for 3D levels. 
to basically speed up rendering and this solved the problem with E1 and M2 and it solved the problem for the entire industry for years. So this was the month that we hired Dunn Punchats, who is an illustrator uh, to create the Doom logo and to work on the Doom box cover. We also created our first alpha version that we could send out to our testers. Uh, we we're pretty happy to show some people what we were up to. And this is what the alpha version looked like after we've been working on the game for three full months. No, DOS doesn't play this music. Uh, this, <laughs> this is added later. Still no sound drivers. So yeah, we were spinning titles around, uh, doing some fun 3D tricks. We had a, just rotating in place in the menu, uh, choosing levels. You know, if this gets out, you can all kiss your version of the game goodbye. We had rolly chairs uh, that you could bump into, which were not fun and were moved. <laughs> um, we even had our, uh, our rifle had a, um, had a knife on the end of it for a while. We took that out. <laughs> we can see how basic it is uh, and just very boxy. This was one of the earliest levels uh, in the game. You can see that we had we really limited in our textures that we had at that point. Uh, the artists were, were going as fast as they could generating textures, but they, um, you know, we, we could only get so much done as, fa as fast as possible with six people on the team, I think. Actually, it was five people. So there were five of us working on the game at this point until August. So you can see we're kind of using a lot of different textures here. Cement and, and this crazy wall texture. A lot of, uh, you can tell that Wolfenstein's influence is still here because the height of the ceiling is is kind of the Wolfenstein height. But then we eventually kind of break out of that. But the final level, this is E1M7, and you can tell the final level looks way better than this. But uh, this is only after three months. So this version still, I believe, exists uh, on the net. So you can, I think you can grab these versions that I'm showing um, from a, a, there's an id history uh, archive that you can grab these down from and use DOSBox to run them. These things leaked out somehow. <laughs> and there's the exit. So um, we're in May now. Greg Punchatz, uh, Don Punchatz's son, he was a you know, Hollywood monster uh, model monster maker. So after you know, we had the clay models ripped apart, you know, he basically started, started making stuff for us. Uh, he got several of them done this month. Our favorite, I think, was, was probably the Spider Mastermind. That was his, his first one, and it was very, very articulated and, and detailed. So uh, this month we put out a pre-beta. That's how fast we're moving. <laughs> Just another month and a few weeks beyond the last one. So almost five months worth of work. Now you can see uh, we're using black and darkness more. Um, the previous versions were less scary. They were kind of bright. Now we're actually um, kind of darkening the game. You can see like there's a menu that didn't exist in the final version using high color DAC and some other modes. So we actually have a menu system in the game now. Uh, we're putting some options in there. Definitely there's a bobbing, uh, bobbing of the character. <laughs> Um, and we had named the, the uh, difficulty levels. We have the key cards in there. Uh, we're, we're experimenting a lot more with uh, light and darkness. We decided that um, the game experience should have a lot of contrast in, uh, yeah, it just disappeared. <laughs> no animations at that point. Um, we decided the contrast in the game in a lot of different ways was really good. So if we had you know, light and dark, uh, tall areas and, and claustrophobic areas, uh, suspenseful exploration and then insane combat. 
um, and just mixing the entire game up with those three different things uh, would make for something that felt, kind of felt like a roller coaster. So nowadays, if you run, if you run the game, um, it, it looks a lot better than this just because we're using, you know, 4K monitors and, and the game has been updated. Uh, but, but back then, this was, this was pretty cool. We can see, you know, we're discovering that having dark things, uh, you know, things moving around in the dark is actually scary. And that was our world map. <laughs> In progress. So I won't go through all the levels, but, uh, but this demo is, uh, is probably showing all of them. OK, so we finally are in, in June, halfway through the year. Chris Lombardi from Computer Gaming World, he came over to get a sneak peek of the game, and he wrote a really great preview article. It's the only one written about Doom. Uh, this, this was the only preview ever about Doom. And we also realized that we have too many biped monsters in the game and we really need some flying ones. So this so was kind of an oversight by Tom and it kind of drew, drove him further away from the team as he was just like getting upset creatively. So it's July and Tom feels kind of isolated and alone. He's not inspired anymore feels like Id's over here, Tom's over there, Tom's not happy. So that's what happens in July. And then in August, um, basically, Tom decides to leave Id. He was our creative director from uh, the beginning of the company. So he came up with all the ideas for the games that we had made up until, you know, probably about Wolfenstein. And, uh, and so he went over to, to Apogee, who was our publisher before Doom, and we licensed Wolfenstein to let him make the sequel to Wolfenstein. So he's just called it Wolfenstein 2 at that point. And then we decided, you know what, we don't want other people to make our sequels. So we, just, we told him, you can license the engine, but not, the, not the, uh, the actual IP. So we told him we're not gonna do that, so then John, Tom just made uh, Rise of the Triad instead which ended up being a really great game. And then he started developing a game called Prey. I don't think you can see that on there, okay. Okay, there it is. <laughs> okay, so we hired a couple uh, new people to help us finish Doom. We hired Dave Taylor, and then the legendary game designer, Sandy Peterson, who made Call of Cthulhu. And now we are in September, getting close. Um, Dave gets to work coding the auto map feature in Doom. Sandy's cranking on making levels. He took a lot of Tom Hall's half-finished designs and he finished them. With all the tech being made during the year, the sound drivers took a back seat to the game engine. Uh, basically, the technical hurdle with the sound drivers was that the game was now in 32-bit mode and we couldn't just use our, own, our old 16-bit drivers. So we found this library called the DMX Sound Library and we included it in Doom. So now we can actually get Bobby Prince in, in the office and start making music and start making sound effects ASAP. So now it's October and uh, we created a press release version of Doom at the beginning of October. And this is what the press release version looked like. So this is with the actual music. No sound effects. I believe the sound effects came in um, probably two weeks or so after this, this press release. So you can see the design is getting a little more polished feels more like, a, like an actual game. You know, AI is moving around. We have platforms and doors and all kinds of stuff working. Uh, in Doom, everything that you see that moves around in the level that's not a monster uh, was something I programmed. So if uh, you're going through lava or you're going through 
slime and taking damage or you see flickering lights or doors opening or stairs building up or um, pretty much anything happening in the environment, I got to program all that stuff. Got power-ups. And then we have these unholy Bibles. <laughs> I think you can see it down there at the bottom. We had a lot of demonic artifacts in the game originally. And also the sky didn't look like that when we released the game. We thought that having the blackness of space up there, uh, even though it was more realistic, it just didn't, it didn't look that good. So we switched out the sky with a, with a much better one that was taken from a book that, had, uh, that was uh, pictures of China. Really cool pictures of China. People actually sourced the, every piece of art that we ever like, may have scanned in or anything has been fully sourced so everyone knows where everything came from. So now it's actually a game. You can tell how long it takes to get a game feeling like a game. I mean, we're, we're in October now, finally. Uh, after nine months of development, now we have something that actually feels like it's gonna be an adventure. <laughs> Still getting stuck on walls. That, that, um, that part doesn't exist anymore. There's several things in, in this press release version. Now, this is the E1M2 room that I originally created to, to do the abstract level design style. And now it's actually as scary as it should be. Blinking lights and everything. So this is what the game looked like then. All right. So we're getting close to wrapping up the game. You know, progress quickened. You saw that even in early October, we still had pickup items that were useless, like demonic daggers, demon chests, and other unholy items. So I decided to get rid of those things because they just made no sense to the core of the game. And earlier on, I even removed the concept of having lives in the game. Lots of games in the past had three lives. So now, it's November. It had to be just about the most insane month of development for Doom. So what we got done in November was the first IPX multiplayer was created that month. Uh, the word deathmatch, you know, in that, just that mode of play, and co-op play, and putting that all in all the levels. The final systems are all coded, everything. We had serial code for modems, so the game would work over, over modems, and then all the maps have been modified to use these brand new <laughs> versions of the game that we had just created. It was a ton of work and a lot of polish at the very end. So the day before Doom, ha you know, d before we released Doom, it just happened to be a really important day in the United States. Violent video games was a topic hotly debated in Congress. So games like Mortal Kombat and Night Trap are shown as examples of the moral level that games have sunk down to. <laughs> they had no idea. Uh, <laughs> so we basically said, don't care, and we released Doom next day. Okay, so it wasn't quite released. There was one final bug. The last day we worked 30 hours straight, um, basically getting the game ready for launch. So there's this one bug. When we left the game running on all of our computers as like a burn-in test, just let the game run, um, some of those computers would lock up, like they would just stop working. The menu, the menu could pop up, but the game behind it would just freeze. So John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening, like this is insane, we're trying to release this game. Um, he thought about it, and he figured out this problem, and then he fixed it and it took like five minutes to fix the game, and this was a problem that was in the engine from the first day we started working on it. Um, that's how good he is. <laughs> so he did some more testing, and the bug was totally gone, and we could finally upload the game to the University of Wisconsin's, that's their mascot, uh, University of Wisconsin's uh, FTP server. So we basically begin uploading the game. You can hear it. We were uploading through modem.
It took a long time. And then the server blew up. <laughs> and then the server blew up a second time because there were, there were basically too many people on the server. Everybody knew Doom was going to be released. And, and before we even uploaded it, the, the maximum number of people that could even download anything on the server was filled. And we had to have the, the sysop basically dump everybody off so we could log in to, to do it again. Blew up again. And then we finally had him you know, give us some more time. So then the game finally got uploaded, and then it, it went everywhere. Uh, it went all over the place that day. So after, the, after Doom was released, basically the world changed. Uh, 3D games were absolutely here to stay. Shooters would dominate the industry for decades. It's the biggest selling game uh, today, or the biggest selling genre today is RFPSs. Game modding is incredibly popular with many important game franchises that came out of modding, such as Call of Duty, Team Fortress 2, Portal, Counter-Strike, and many others. Multiplayer is a staple of games, and free-to-play, slash shareware, uh, is the most popular business model of our times. So I'd like to thank those who took the journey with me and made it all possible. Couldn't have happened without these people at that time, and the support of the fans of our games, obviously. So this was uh, id software at the time. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Um, so I think that I'm going to be doing some Q&A. Yeah. If you have any questions, by the way, you can email me at that, uh, that email address. Thank you Which so much. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Let's give him another round of applause. That was amazing. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of questions for you, right. John. So I'm going to try to get through as many of these as possible. All right. So first question, what is your one, one? Key ingredient you have in all of your successful games? Uh, geez, uh, made them with a team that was very inspired to make the game. I think that's probably the number one thing. Uh, the great, you know, the, the, real, the really great games has, have a really great team behind them, and, uh, and people love playing the game while you're making it. Like, if you're not playing the game, can't be good. So uh, you really need to be playing it, and when you have a team that's totally playing your game all the time, you know you have a winner. Awesome. A lot of people want to know, what do you think about the 2005 movie, Doom? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to remake it, by the way. <laughs> what do you play in your spare time? Jeez, so many games. Uh, we play a lot. Well, there's a game that we... My wife plays Drop 7. Uh, I play Drop 7 as well, not as much as her or as well as she does. But um, we play pretty much everything that comes out. Uh, we kind of have to stay on top of everything. So What Remains of Edith Finch was one of the, one of the newer, really cool narrative exploration games. Uh, Fortnite, obviously. I still play World of Warcraft. Uh, still play Minecraft. And uh, I actually do a lot of Doom tournaments. Like, there's a lot of Doom tournaments going on all over the place. And, uh, and I play Quake Deathmatch in the office every week, and we're having a Doom tournament in Ireland in July. So, <laughs> but yeah, we play a lot of, I play a lot of, uh, a lot of games, basically. You have to stay on top of everything. Cool. So, there's a lot of younger developers in the audience. One says, I never read D&D, and I've not played Quake or Doom. Am I too young to become a great game developer? No way. <laughs> the games of the future have to be made from these games. Uh, and these are games of the past. So yeah, everybody, everybody needs to learn from you know, the, the, the games that they're inspired by. And it's never too late. Obviously, games are not going to stop being made anytime soon. You've got plenty of time, um, especially if you're young. So, uh, so yeah, find, find games that you really like and, and try to make something that's, that's that good at least and hopefully better. Awesome. 
People want to know, are there any key lessons that you learned with Daikatana, and what would you change if you had to do it again? Um, Daikatana is really the, the question, that's a really interesting question that I am, that I've answered many times, actually. Um, with Daikatana, uh, with, actually with Doom and with Quake, having those games be open really created a ton of people that were interested in modding. There were a lot of people that became level designers, a lot of people started learning how to program by uh, writing Quake scripts. Um, and so there, were a lot, there was a lot of talent out there that, uh, that I felt was just like myself when I was, when I, or like me when I was growing up, where uh, I was super driven to make games and I was doing it in my spare time. And these people are also doing it in their spare time. And I thought that, you know, um, if I built a team full of super passionate people that would actually make games at home, uh, I would like to have those people on my team and, and basically see what we, can, what we can make. So the people that I hired for Daikatana were all modders. They were all people that had been doing this in their spare time. And I was the only person that had ever made a game before uh, on my team. So it was a lot of teaching that team how to make a game. And it took three years to do that. Um, and of course, there, there are some uh, errors in the game, you know, bugs and stuff, because these people were learning how to program even. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was an interesting experiment. But um, I think that giving people the chance to, to do something like that was more important than that game not being the best game ever made. Amazing. Okay, one last question. What is the weirdest device that you have played Doom on? How about a refrigerator? <laughs> Uh, yeah, or a printer, uh, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah, I think probably, you know, not a weird device, but just like a really old computer, like a VIC-20. Uh, mm. Unbelievably, people can do that with character sets. Um, but yeah, that was probably the weirdest one, just a really old computer that actually shouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, you can find really fast chips buried everywhere, so... So getting Doom running on, you know, stuff like that isn't as crazy as going back to the old computers and trying to make them do it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, John. Right. That was wonderful. Oh, another question? <laughs> Catch John at the break if you can. <laughs> All right? Oh, you want number one? Version control. Okay, version they want to know, how did All you right. handle version control? Okay, version control. Guess what? Didn't happen. <laughs> Basically, we had floppy disks. Um, and we had our hard drives that we were making the game on. And uh, we had our own disks that had labels that had all kinds of cool art drawn on them. So we knew, like, this is Romero's Fortress, and this is Tom's, you know, Tom's disk and, and John's disk. And uh, the source files that we were working on, or the data that we were working on, would go onto our disk. And when we put it in someone else's computer, they would just copy everything over because none of it was going to, there was no merging, there was no anybody touching anyone else's files. So if I'm working on save load, I'm, no one's touching that, I can just overwrite anybody's save load you know, file. So we just copy everything off the disks over what was in, in our Doom directory and uh, source safe was, hey, I, I, who has a copy of that file on their computer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you've ever had to restore a, a source database for a you know, repo and you're, scrapping, you're know, scraping off everybody's hard drives. <laughs> we didn't really have to do that, though. It was pretty good. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> one way to avoid merge conflicts, right? That's right. No merging. All right. Okay. Well, let's give John a nice big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Much.